Proverbs. So just draw your eyes up there to the screens, if you would. Nice and loud, guys. The book of Proverbs. The word proverb typically refers to a short, clever saying that offers some kind of wisdom. And this book has a lot of those. But they're almost all in the center section of the book, chapters 10 to 29. But there is way more going on in the book of Proverbs, especially at the beginning, chapters 1 through 9, and the conclusion, chapters 30 and 31. The book's been designed with an introduction, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And it first of all links this book to King Solomon. Now remember the story in 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon had asked God for wisdom to lead Israel well. And so Solomon became known as the wisest man in the ancient world. And we're told in 1 Kings chapter 4 that he wrote thousands of proverbs and poems and collected knowledge about plants and animals. So Solomon was like the fountainhead of Israel's wisdom literature. So while not all the material in this book is written by him personally, he is where Israel's wisdom tradition begins. The introduction says that by reading this book, you too can gain wisdom. Now, wisdom for most of us means knowledge, but the Hebrew word chokhmah means much more than just mental activity. It refers to action also. So think skill or applied knowledge. This is why back in the book of Exodus, chapter 31, it was artists and craftsmen in Israel who were said to have chokhmah. So the purpose of this book is to help you develop a set of practical skills for living well in God's world. And this gets linked with another key idea in the introduction, the fear of the Lord. Now fear here is not about terror. It's about a healthy sense of reverence and awe for God and about my place in the universe. It's a moral mindset that recognizes I am not God and that I don't get to make up my own definitions of good and evil and right and wrong. Rather, I need to humble myself before God and embrace God's definition of right and wrong, even when that's inconvenient for me. Now, this introduction leads us into the first main section of the book, chapters 1 through 9, which also doesn't contain short one-liner proverbs. Rather, what we find here are 10 speeches from a father to a son about how the son should listen to wisdom and cultivate the fear of the Lord and live accordingly, which means a life of virtue and integrity and generosity, all of which lead to success and peace. And the father warns his son also about folly and evil and stupid decisions that will breed selfishness and pride, all leading to ruin and shame. And so the son should make the pursuit of wisdom and the fear of the Lord his highest goal in life. And this way of thinking, it forms the moral logic of this entire book. Now, these speeches from the Father also clue us into what biblical wisdom literature is and how it's different from other parts of the Bible. These books explore how to live well in God's world, but wisdom is not the same as law, like what Moses gave Israel at Mount Sinai. And it's not the same as prophecy, divine speech to God's people. Rather, wisdom literature has the accumulated insight of God's people through the generations about how to live in a way that honors God and others. And so, through the book of Proverbs now, these human words about wisdom have been put together as God's word and wisdom to his people, which connects to the other thing you find in chapters 1 through 9. There are four poems from Lady Wisdom. Here, wisdom has been poetically personified as a woman who calls out to humanity to pay attention and to seek her. Wisdom says that she is woven into the fabric of the universe, and so wherever you see people making wise decisions, they are relying on her. So you see someone being generous or having sexual integrity or upholding justice. They are drawing on wisdom. Right. These Lady Wisdom poems, they're a creative, poetic way of exploring this idea that we live in God's moral universe and that goodness and justice are objective realities that we ignore to our own peril. And so fearing the Lord, living wisely, it's living along the grain of the universe. Now together, these two sets of speeches from the Father and Lady Wisdom, they make a powerful claim about this book, that you're not simply reading good advice, you're reading God's own invitation to learn wisdom from previous generations. And so in the next section of the book, chapters 10 through 29, we find hundreds of ancient proverbs, and they apply wisdom and the fear of the Lord to every life topic you could imagine. Family, work, neighborhood, friendship, sex, marriage, money, anger, forgiveness, alcohol, debt, everything. And these are all filtered through the value system of Proverbs 1 through 9.
Now, these Proverbs, they're all pretty short. They're easy to memorize. And actually, this section of the book is meant to become a reference work that you return to time and time again throughout the years, which raises some important issues in learning how to read these Proverbs. First of all, Proverbs are by nature about probabilities. So you fear the Lord and you make wise, good choices. Things will likely go well for you. And if you don't fear the Lord, you're foolish. Your life will likely not go so well. Now, that is all often true, but not always, mm. which leads to the next point, that Proverbs are not promises. They're not formulas for success. That's so important, some guys. Proverbs, Understand for example, that. The fear of the Lord prolongs your life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. Or train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't turn from it. So yes, Fearing God, being a moral person, will most likely lead to a better, longer life. And raising your kids in a stable, loving home does set them up well. But there are no guarantees. Lots of things can and often do go wrong in our world. And so lastly, Proverbs by nature focus on the general rule, but not the exceptions, which are many. And the wisdom books actually aren't ignorant of that. The exceptions are what the other wisdom books, Job and Ecclesiastes, are all about. And together, these acknowledge that life is too complex for simple formulas, which is why we need all of the wisdom books together to get the bigger picture. This all leads to the final section of the book, two large collections of poems. First, poems from a man named Agur, who begins by acknowledging his own ignorance and folly and his great need for God's wisdom. And then Agur discovers that divine wisdom has been given to him in the scriptures, which teach him how to live well. And so Agur is put before us as like a model reader of the book of Proverbs, somebody who's always open to hearing God's wisdom through the scriptures. The final poems are connected to a man named Lemuel. He's a non-Israelite king, and he passes on the wisdom that was given to him by his mom. It's guidance for being a wise and just leader. And then the final poem is an acrostic or an alphabet poem where each line begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the entire poem's about the woman of noble character. It depicts a woman who lives according to the wisdom of Proverbs and stands like a model of someone who takes God's wisdom and then translates it into practical decisions in everyday life, at work or at home, in her family and in her community. So the book opened with words from a father to a son about listening to Lady Wisdom. And so now the book closes by offering the words of a mother to her son about a woman who lives wisely. The book of Proverbs is for every person in every season of life. It's a guide for living wisely and well in God's good world. And that's what the book of Proverbs is all about. Amen. You can go home. <laughs> I, I love those little, uh, they're all on YouTube. I, I love those little, they have them for each book of the Bible, and uh, I think they're done really, really well. Sometimes I, you know, listen, anytime you're getting into scriptures, there's always uh, points of, of questioning, like, uh, you know, maybe you have a difference of opinion or whatever, like Lemuel, I, I believe, is Solomon personally, but, um, uh, you know, it, it's not that big of a deal, you know, to, to, well, he was just a king outside of whatever, so it doesn't really matter, but. Anyway, we're going to begin the book of Proverbs uh, tonight, so let's pray. Father, as we begin the book of wisdom, I pray that we would apply wisdom, uh, Lord, that we would walk in wisdom, God, that we, we wouldn't just settle for knowledge and, uh, and some type of understanding, but God, that we would actually use it in our lives, Lord, and uh, we would understand uh, that, God, this is the desire of your heart for us, and um, this is why you would take a king uh, this man who desired wisdom above all else, give him that wisdom so that what he has written down, what he has compiled, Lord, would be beneficial to us even today, thousands of years later. And so, uh, Father, the, uh, the Bible, the book that just lays on a shelf and, and is just there collecting dust, Father, does us no good. Uh, Lord, unless we take it, read it, and then apply it, be doers of the word, not hearers only, Lord, we are going to suffer as a result of that. And so, God, uh, even though we know that these are not promises necessarily that are given to us, God, we do know that if we will but follow them, there is blessing that will come with them, Lord. There is blessing in obedience, uh, Father, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Lord, there is uh, pain and heartache and disobedience, and so I pray that we would walk as an obedient people, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. So as we begin the book of Proverbs, uh, a couple things here. Uh, J. Vernon McGee, one of my favorite, favorite uh, uh, teachers and uh, a guy that, you know, was a Calvary Chapel pastor before there were Calvary chapels, uh, writes this. He says, Solomon is the writer of the uh, next three books of the Bible, meaning Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Proverbs is the book on wisdom. Ecclesiastes is the book on folly. And the Song of Solomon is the book on love. Love is the happy medium between wisdom and folly. Folly. So Solomon is an authority on all three subjects. And I love that thought process that he goes into there. And so we know we're going to be dealing with wisdom when it comes to the book of Proverbs. Key verse, of course, as was suggested in the video, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And, uh, and when we say that, just so you know, we're not just drawing a, a, a line in the sand between the church and the world. Let me tell you, there are many times in your lives and in my life where we practice, unfortunately, a lack of wisdom, you know, where we, we know better and, uh, and we fall into sinful practice or we do things because we have lost our fear of the Lord. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life I know if I'm practicing sinful practices in my life, it's because I desire that more than I fear the Lord. And that's usually the recipe for disaster in your life, right? And uh, I would say the fear of the Lord, as was described, it, it is. It's more of the idea of awe. It's more the idea of uh, understanding and recognizing the beauty. But I would also say there is something wonderfully healthy about realizing, as God described to Job, um, uh, Job, you're on earth, I'm in heaven. Listen, um, that, that's, that's, a, that's a moment of clarity that Job had to come to, right? You know, when God reminds him, I'm here, you're there, you better listen to me, uh, that should put you into somewhat of a fearful uh, idea and understanding that, that God is the one who's the supreme authority. And um, I remember I had a T-shirt years ago, and it was on the New Age, and it said, um, there are two truths, uh, there is a God and you're not him. And um, I think that that's the healthy fear of the Lord, when you realize that you aren't a God under yourself. And unfortunately, we live in a day and in a time where a lot of people do believe that they are a God unto themselves. A proverb is a saying that conveys specific truth at a pointed, uh, in a pointed, pithy way. Proverbs are short sentences drawn from long experience. I like that. I'll read that to you again. Proverbs are short sentences drawn from long experience. And um, a truth uh, couched in a form that is easy to remember, a philosophy based on experience, and a rule for conduct. So that gives you kind of a little intro. Uh, Solomon, Solomon uh, compiled the Proverbs. We know between songs and, um, and Proverbs, he, was, he, he, he had said himself over 3,000 uh, that he had. And, and in the book of Proverbs, you get just shy of 1,000 of them, thereabouts. And so you get exposed to a lot of, and some people believe that these are his top favorite ones. He didn't necessarily write them all, but he compiled them. It's kind of like, you remember when you were young and you were going to date that special person, and what did you give them? You gave them that little cassette that had a bunch of songs compiled on it that you really like. You know what I'm talking, you remember those things? Yeah, that's right. And, and you're not the one that wrote the songs, you're not the one who sang the songs nor performed the songs, but you compiled the songs. And so Solomon compiled um, these Proverbs, many from him, by the way, many would be uh, Solomon's, but as, they, um, as he pointed out in the video, uh, Agur is one person who, and uh, Lemuel is another person who wrote some of the uh, Proverbs that are, are uh, committed to the book also. So I wanted you to understand because it's important that you realize that these Proverbs were sayings. There, are, there are some reason to believe, by the way, that some of the Proverbs may also be uh, partly as a result of some of the Proverbs that were floating around in the Orient of the day. And so there were some things that were just truths uh, that resonated with Solomon that were written by who knows, and uh, they were compiled also and used. So it wasn't just like Solomon just sat around going, you know, what am I going to say about wisdom, you know? There were some things that he had also been privy to and that he knew, and I believe a lot of it's just from uh, the Lord and the Lord revealing to him what he wanted written. The one thing we do know, the bottom line, whether it was Agur, whether it was uh, Lemuel, whether it was another a writer from in, in the Orient at the time, or Solomon himself, the truth is God was behind it all. And that's why we have the book of Proverbs that we have today. 
And there's great, great, great benefit in reading the book of Proverbs. I've done this in my life. I'm sure many of you have also. And that's where, because there's 31 chapters, where in a month you'll just read a chapter every, uh, every day. You read just a different chapter of the book of Proverbs. You find yourself in a month with 31 days going through it. If you'll read five Psalms, by the way, in the same way, you'll go through Proverbs and Psalms in a year is what you'll do. So if you're interested in going through the book, if you're interested in going through the books, if you're interested in learning more about the Lord, great thing about the book of Proverbs, it really is a reference. You will find answers or at least um, a thought involving a lot of the things that you're dealing with even today. It deals with all types of topics. If you want a topical, topical study, the book of Proverbs is very interesting because it deals with all types of topics. So it is a great book of wisdom. It's God's wisdom for you and I today, written or compiled by a person who unfortunately started off really, really strong but ended up really, really, really disappointing. And, um, and so you will see, uh, as we go through uh, the, the Proverbs and the wisdom, unfortunately written by a person who didn't necessarily walk them out, uh, which gives us great hope also. Why? Because the reality of it is God doesn't use only those who are perfect. Amen? Amen. You know, He uses those who are broken. He uses those, unfortunately, that aren't even walking in the things of the Lord at this time. So verse 1 Chapter 1 says, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, is what it starts off with there. And uh, and again, making no mistake, even though it says Solomon, uh, God is the one who writes these. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. Uh, That's an important statement because uh, to know wisdom and instruction He is not making an esoteric statement, meaning it's not just a very defined statement to a very defined group of people who have a who have a specific need. This is not what this is written to. This is written broad based to a wide variety of people is what he's saying to give them wisdom and instruction. Literally, the idea is to be practical. The book of Proverbs is an extremely practical book. Those who love James, you know, if you're really into the book of James, the book of Proverbs would probably be your Old Testament equivalent to that, the idea of what's being written here and what to walk out and what to live. Uh, The word that he used in the uh, video, and it's the word for wisdom, is uh, chokhmah. And chokhmah simply is just simply uh, the the meaning of of that. It's just wisdom. But it's more than just being wise, just so you understand. We have the the connotation of wisdom being uh, that guy's really, really, you know, he's applying what he's learning. That's wisdom, right? We always go with the knowledge is the application. But wisdom has with it the definite connotation that you are walking out what it is you know. So it's not a matter of just knowing. It's a matter of actually doing the things that you know. It's the application of that. Truly living these things out. And that's the idea uh, of what goes on here. There's a a principle in the scriptures that's called uh, the principle of first mention. And when you become an avid studier of the Word of God, you will hear that term. If you go to a Bible college or or anywhere where you're starting to divide the Word, they talk about the principle of first mention. The principle of first mention just simply states where you see it first mentioned in the Scriptures, back in the Old Testament, where it first gets mentioned, you have to pay close attention to it because it will help define every time it's mentioned after that. And so basically the word that's mentioned here, this chokhmah, is mentioned in the Old Testament. And it's mentioned, first of all, uh, the root word that's used there, to be wise, is mentioned for uh, Joseph as he interprets Pharaoh's um, sort of crazy dream. Uh, And uh, he knows, Pharaoh knows by the response that he gets from Joseph that he needs a person that can not only interpret the dream, but can actually put into process the things that he's learning. Listen, in Genesis 41, 39, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. It's the same word that's used there. So in other words, we know that Joseph was made number two in the uh, in the land of Egypt at the time. And really, Joseph was to implement what he knows to do. And we know that that basically he he saved Egypt is what he did. Um, with his discernment and with the way he applied, you know, with the grain houses and everything else. So the truth is, it's the application of the wisdom that you know. That's exactly what it's getting into. Another time that it's used, uh, the word chokmah is used there, is in Exodus. 
And it's Moses, uh, it, God is giving Moses instruction about making the priest's garments, uh, Exodus 28 and 3. So you shall speak to all who are gifted um, artists whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, and they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as a priest, that all those who have the spirit of wisdom. And so you and I have to understand, again, and the reason I'm saying this, because when we start in the book of Proverbs, as we're doing, Whenever you see that terminology of wisdom, it is always with the idea of application. It is always with the idea that you are going to do something. It is never about just a, again, a, a word that's being used that's sort of ethereal and wisdom. Well, wisdom can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. It's not a dreamlike trance state. It is the actual doing is what it is. You are applying what you know to be true. And the good news is the scriptures actually Give us those things that we need to apply. So verse 3 says, to receive the instruction of wisdom. Now, if we would have touted tonight in the opening of the book of Proverbs as the opportunity to go to school, we'd have half the amount of people here because a lot of people don't want to go to school, right? I wouldn't have shown up if I said that this is like going to school. The reason I say that is because that's what it says here, to receive the instruction of wisdom. It is going to school. You are learning now. Wisdom is going to instruct you is what it's going to do. And as we read, or what she is going to do, they use the feminine gender often when speaking of wisdom. Uh, Watchman Nee writes some wonderful, beautiful thoughts on the idea of wisdom and the feminine uh, that's used for, and also, by the way, the feminine that's used for the Holy Spirit often. So to receive the instruction of wisdom, well, what's the result of the instruction of wisdom? So if you imply or apply the instruction of wisdom, you're uh, ability to discern or discern correctly will lead to justice. That's what he tells us. He just gives us the three words down there. So if I receive the instruction of wisdom, I will also understand and discern correctly justice. We live in a world today where people are trying to discern justice. Well, what's justice? What does justice look like? Well, if you apply the instruction of wisdom, you will understand what justice is. You, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you what justice is. I don't think that this is just. Well, apply the Holy Spirit's instruction. You'll find out. And uh, to follow the best course of action, then he goes on and he says that leads to judgment. You have, if you have troubles in your life, coming up and discerning and making proper judgments. Many people have problems. Look, not to be funny, in all seriousness, I talk to, talk to women who keep dating the same guy. They break up with this guy and they go right back to the same guy, you know, uh, an abuser, uh, an alcoholic, whatever. And they go right back to the same guy and you're like, I can't believe it. Why are you doing this? Well, it's because they lack judgment. They lack the discernment to be able to judge properly. If you want to have discernment, you've got to rely on the instruction of wisdom. And if you apply justice in your judgment, you will treat all people with with. Um, Dignity and respect, and that's equity. That's why they use the word equity there. That's treating people with respect and dignity. That's the idea. Born-again believers, you and I as a Christian believer, we should be accused all the time of treating people with respect and dignity. The, the, the least racist people in the world should be born-again believers. Red or yellow, black and white, we should be the least because we should treat all people. See, it shouldn't be a matter of pigmentation. It should be a matter of understanding that man, man needs salvation, man or woman. And often when I refer to man in the, in the text here, it'll be for all sexes. Um, all two, by the way. All two sexes. Not all 29 or 79 or 149 or anything else. Um, I don't know how to use pronouns very well. So, uh, But anyway... That's the idea. This is what he's getting at. And this is what Solomon is kind of leading to. And you know, one of the things that's interesting about Solomon, obviously Solomon did not have a hang up about different cultures and different people, did he? I mean, you know, concubines and wives, thousand of them. Um, yeah, unfortunately led to his demise. So that's what it says in the, in the text there, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. And that's why we were uh, breaking that down in the way we were. The wise person honors God and God protects that person. So uh, wisdom, you're going to hear a lot about it. In fact, it will be very redundant to you, this text on wisdom, but it is the idea that we need to, um, to understand and apply. A foolish person refuses to obey God. A foolish person won't 
listen to the instruction. In fact, they will close their ears off to the instruction of the Lord. Verse 4 says to give uh, prudence uh, to, the, to the simple is what it means there. And the root of simple simply means an open door. Now think about what's being said here. To give prudence um, um, to the simple. And again, simple being uh, an open door, the simple-minded. Um, they don't know how to keep thoughts out of their mind. You know, when you're simple-minded, you have no guard in your mind. You just kind of anything comes in and anything goes out. You ever, you ever tell someone, man, that, that guy's a simple-minded guy. Now, sometimes we look at simple and we go, wow, that guy has a wonderful simplicity about him. You know, he doesn't get too gummed up with complex items or thoughts or anything else. That's not a bad way. But the problem is in the the terminology that's used here for simple, it just simply means open-minded. They have no guard. They're just open to whatever. Well, he's telling us um, that if you will follow this instruction, you will find that you are prudent now, that you are on guard, that you are using truth as the standard of letting whatever it is that's coming into your life, you're going to use truth. So, so whether it's a woman who can't make the decision about that man or it's a guy making a business decision or whatever else that seems to get fouled up in, in the business world all the time, well, if you allow instruction to speak to you, if you allow wisdom, excuse me, to speak to you, you will find yourself being much more prudent about the decisions that you're going to make. The, great, uh, the greatness of the book of Proverbs to me is the idea of the level playing field it puts everybody on. Everybody, and there's no one in this room who is outside of the instruction nor the benefits of the book of Proverbs if you're willing to commit yourself to the principles of the book of Proverbs and if you're willing to live by them. It is, in essence, a guide that God gives to us to say, hey, if you want to understand how to live a prudent life, if you want to understand how to live a life consecrated to the idea of truth, um, I can tell you that these are the steps in your life. So if you're a tick off the box kind of person, if you're the person who loves a list, the book of Proverbs is right up your alley because you just have to simply follow what it's telling you to do. And if you will do it, there are certain, there are certain attributes, there are certain circumstances that will certainly come about as a result of doing that. And so it's, it's, um, it's offensive if we call someone simple-minded today, but the truth is that's exactly what the scripture is saying. If you don't want to follow instruction, you're simple-minded. You have no guard. Your door is wide open, and anything and everything will come in. So he says to the young man there also, uh, continuing on in verse 4, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Young man to the, uh, to the, to the young person. Now, a young person here, by the way, can be uh, uh, anyone from a teenager uh, into uh, early adult life. That's what he's getting at. <clears throat> so to the young man, but I believe that the... Uh, Principles are good for anyone and everyone here, by the way. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. Um, Knowledge and discretion, what he's getting at is, of course, accumulating more of the facts, accumulating more of the stuff that you're learning. But the discretion, then, is the filter. It's the screen that you're now putting all that, all that through. The, the stuff you're learning, you're now putting it through the filter is what you're doing. And... Um, what it's literally there for is as you're looking at a sinful condition or you're looking at something you're not quite sure about, you are learning by this process to think it through. To the young person, think. This is what, this is what the, the proverb is saying. Think about what you're doing. Don't just rush in. You know, sometimes when, you know, when you're younger and if you're impetuous, impulsive, you know, I'm the guy that goes into shop, right? Then my wife gives me the, the list that's, that's gilded, and, and I am sworn to this is how much, and I come out with five times the amount because I'm so impulsive. They get me every time, right? Well, what the, what the writer is saying to us is, hey, think about it. Think about what you're looking at. Think about what you're discerning. Apply wisdom to what you're looking about or what you're looking at. And you know how it is. I mean, when you're younger, whether it's testosterone or, or uh, just the need to fit in and, and, and be part of, sometimes we don't think about things. That's my wife calling me with a shopping list. That's what she's calling me. Gary, I was just looking at the receipt. Um, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Make responsible choices, okay? Uh, again, the, practi- the practicality of a verse 5. A wise man will hear and increase learning. I love that word here that's used there. Quick to listen. 
Be quick to listen. Be slow to speak. It's a great way of learning, isn't it? You know, if you're sitting and someone's instructing and you're learning, you're, you're being mentored, whatever it is, discipled, and the only thing you can do is sit there and think while that person's talking about your response, you're not listening. You're not listening. You see, he's saying absorb, absorb. That's why it says in James 1.19, you know it, understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone be quick to hear. Be, uh, this is from the Amplified Version, by the way. Be quick to hear. Be careful, thoughtful, listener. Slow to speak. A speaker carefully chosen words. Slow to anger. Be patient, reflective, and forgiving. I love that text. I think it's a beautiful text. Again, if you will apply it, if you will apply it, the benefits that come from it. Be a man of understanding, and you will attain wise counsel. You know what that is? You're never, ever, ever, ever so filled to the top with knowledge that you can't learn something. It's like my clothes hamper when I was single. Clothes hamper, like the corner of my bathroom. You could just keep piling it up, right? It just gets larger and larger and larger to look like the blob, the monster that ate Camp Halawasa. Actually, it's probably what it would have been. So, you know, that's but what he's saying here to us is you can never be too full of yourself. You shouldn't be anyway to attain wise counsel. Be quick to listen to wise counsel. When you find someone who is godly and can instruct in godly uh, ways, you latch on to that person. Look at them like a treasure. When you have time to sit and talk to someone that you respect, that's a godly uh, example that, that can share wisdom with you, uh, you know, that, that person should be valued in your life. You know, sometimes we, we want to gather to us people that will tell us what we want to hear. That's usually your peers, by the way. You know, you'll find your peer group and because they'll tell you what you want to hear. What you need to find is someone who will tell you the truth. You know, you want to find someone who's going to be honest and it's going to be open. It's going to say, hey, I, I think you're really messing up here. And this is why this is what the word of God says. This is what he's telling us uh, to get to there. That's exactly what we need to do. What's the opposite of this type of person? Well, the opposite of this person who gives really bad advice. Think back to the track record of the people you've gotten advice from and start to sort of quantify what it is they've said to you. And start to think of all the bad advice you've gotten from people. And usually it's someone, A, who is not walking with the Lord. Or B, someone who had walked with the Lord. And now they've got their own funky religion going on. You know, they got their own. They were sitting in their mother's basement eating Cheetos. And, you know, listening to some tape of a guy who's in, you know, whatever, never, never land. And, um, and now, they're, now they know all the wisdom of the ages, you know. Listen, there's a reason the early church fathers were the early church fathers. There's a reason for a couple thousand years their writings have endured and that the Word of God is the Word of God. When someone comes up with a new kind of, they've discovered something new, I'm always, 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 always suspect of it at first. I've got to be honest with you. You can call it closed-minded or you can call it, you know, discerning is what it is. So be careful of the advice you get from people and uh, the things that you hear. You know, think about it. Solomon's writing this wonderful stuff down, but even by the end of his life, his own son, Rehoboam, man, goes, shoo, he goes way off track. Why? Because he watched his dad. And by the way, Solomon will go way off track with parenting. Why? Because he watched his dad, David, go whoosh, way off track. So there's something to be learned just by looking at the lives of these guys and the things that they were doing. And how, while they were very wise in the things that they would say, and, you know, Rehoboam, not necessarily, uh, they weren't living it out. And so you saw the, the discrepancies, unfortunately, in their own lives. Six says, to understand a proverb and an enigma. I like it, an enigma wrapped in a mystery. The words of the wise and their riddles. So if you will follow this, you will start to understand the deeper, deeper things. Proverbs will sharpen your mind to do what? To study the scriptures. The more you start to develop the idea and the application of the wisdom that you're learning, the more that you start looking at these things and truly walking in them and being consistent with them, it will increase your study of the whole Word of God. You will start to understand the wisdom that are written in these pages, that's for sure. And so the book of Proverbs will also help you to discern those things that are a little more difficult to understand. We talked Sunday morning a little bit about the idea of revelation and illumination. The revelation of God is already contained. There's no revelation of God coming out. There's no, there's no, listen, when someone comes up and says, I've got the new revelation of God, uh, you know, that was Joseph Smith with the, the pearl of great price and all these cults and all these people that come out with a new book, a new gospel. We just discovered a new gospel. Eh, no, you didn't. 
There's 66 books. That's it. There's no more. Now, I know that sounds narrow, but I follow a guy who said narrow is the way. So I'm all right with narrow. I can live in the world of narrow. I'm called narrow-minded. I'm okay with narrow-minded because I'm told that that's exactly what Jesus said to us. Narrow is the way. The truth is there is illumination that comes along with the Word of God, though. And there's, there, there is the new illumination that goes on more and more and more. And I believe the closer we get to the end time, the closer we get to the latter part of these days that we're in, the more illumination you're going to see where God's Word is opened up. And we are giving more expression. We're giving more that's in the Word of God. Be careful. And I understand, look, not everyone who says they have new revelations is a bad person. I just think that they're using the Word the wrong way. I think it comes down to illumination as opposed to revelation is what it is. The fear of the Lord, our verse that we're kind of building on. By the way, this is used in some shape or form or in context nine different times in the book of Proverbs. This idea, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Uh, and, then, and the next time we look at it, it'll say the beginning of wisdom. So, so when it says here is knowledge and wisdom, in both cases, that comes with what? The fear of the Lord. So it's interesting to me. We live in a society and in a time where we look at the academic, you know, these bastions that we call universities, and we get all gaga and like, oh, these places are just so wonderful. Yet maybe the least uh, wise and knowledgeable places you can go to. Now, wait, now you're just a hater on academics. No, no, no. I'm just telling you what the Word says. The beginning of, the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge comes, starts with the fear of the Lord. I am not saying that you shouldn't learn about sciences. I'm not saying you shouldn't learn about math and everything else. You should learn all these things. But everything, the apex of it all, everything comes down to the idea of knowing who God is. And then out of knowing who God is. Listen, the greatest discoveries in science and everything else, it's interesting to me how the world says, you Christians hate science. It's, it's the furthest thing from the truth. We were the beginning of science and these things. And so the truth is, the truth is this. We, we should reacquire the desire to scientifically be able to look at the things that we look at and to be able to explain the things that we know. Because we do fear the Lord. We do hold him in respect and all. You, there are a lot of really, really smart, smart, smart people when it comes to certain things. But when it comes to the truth, when it comes to the truth of who God is, and again, if you believe he is the beginning of wisdom, which he is, um, you can't know that truth unless you first know who he is. You're just not going to know it. Albert Einstein was a really, really smart guy. The problem, and I hate to say it this way, is if Albert Einstein doesn't know who Jesus is, he's not feeling so smart now. That's a terrible thing, right? But if you want to understand the beginning of all the study and all the understanding, Christian students should be the brightest students in the world. Born-again believers should be the smartest people on their campuses. Because you start with the premise of knowing who the Creator is. You start with the premise of knowing who it was that put into the minds of people the maths and the sciences and the English and everything else that goes on, the study of all these things. You know the person that put it on the heart of people, that revealed these things to individuals. So the fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of knowledge. But fools, hmm, so as I look at that university and they're once again screaming and hollering about those people who believe in creation on some level. Well, you know what they're exposing? It says right here, but they're fools. They despise wisdom and instruction and despises a pure hatred. It's an evil, evil hatred. That's what they have. It's not just a matter of apathy. Apathy would be one thing. You know, I was just saying to someone the other day, you know, it's funny, isn't it? These people who call themselves, you know, the Dawkins and all the other guys out there that are, that are you know, talking about... Um, they're, they're basically their angst, their bitterness against uh, Christianity. They're atheists. And yet they're so fervent in their passion and their hatred of God. And you're thinking, how in the world can you be an atheist and still have such a passion and hatred for God? I, I don't have a passion. Listen, I am not passionately hating the tooth fairy. <laughs> right? I just hate that tooth fairy. I don't believe in him, but I just hate him. I mean, that makes no sense, does it? It makes no sense. It's because somewhere deep down in those crevices, somewhere in that mind, there's something that works there. And the conviction, on whatever level it comes to, the hatred that boils up results from the fact that somewhere along the line there is a truth at work 
there's a truth at work. So anyway, the fear of anything else, as, as we say, the fear of anything else other than God is a lack of faith. It's a key verse, so always remember that. The, the key theme verse to this book is right there. So just understand what that means. God is not wanting us to be afraid of him in the sense that we are scared to death of him. That's the secular world that purports that, right? I'm just scared of God. If they, You know, a lot of people in the secular world believe in God, but they always seem to believe in, either they believe in a thunderbolt God or they believe in this lovey-dovey God. Like he just got out of, you know, the, uh, the Scooby-Doo van. You know what I mean? Raggy. You know what I mean? It's like they, they just believe he's like a hippie God, you know, and yeah, Raggy. So um, the reality of it is, uh, the truth of it all is, is, uh, he is he is neither of those. You know, he's not the God with a lightning bolt to divide your hair do, and he's also not the God who's getting out of a Scooby snack van. That's not what he is. Deuteronomy 6 tells us this. It's about relationship. God tells Moses that he wants the people to fear him, okay? So to obey him is what he wants. But then he goes on and he says this in 6.5 there. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. What is it that God wants? He wants you to love him with everything you have. Isn't that interesting? Wait, I thought the God of the, God of the Old Testament was the God of thunder, right? <laughs> How do those people sing with those voices? I have no idea. <laughs> But this is a God that loves, even way back, even way back, loves. This has always been his intention for mankind. It was never about thunderbolts and all the other things. It was always about, I want to walk with you. I want to have a relationship with you. This is my desire for you, that you would know me. Listen, the whole idea of Jesus coming into the world, that the world might be reconciled back to the Father. What is, what is reconciled? To be brought back into relationship. Amen. This is what it's always been about. So don't let people you know, trip you out with the idea that that's not what God was interested in. God was always interested in bringing us back into reconciliation, to bring us back into this beautiful, wonderful idea of relationship with Him. And verse 8 says, my son, I love what he says here. So what do we read this passage is by? He's our dad, and we're his child. See, when you're reading about what God's thoughts are in the book of Proverbs, you should read it as a sort of a family memoir. You should read it as the idea that he's our dad. He says, my son. That's a term of endearment, right? My son is what he says to us there. We're his children. Um, the only problem with that is as we read that, my son, Solomon, writing this, again, it reminds us of 700 wives, 300 concubines, and Rehoboam, right? It makes us think of his son and the way he raised his son, unfortunately. Then he uses that word here again, um, here, used a dozen times in the book. We must be willing to hear from God. Are you willing to hear from God? Is that the desire of your heart, to hear him? Is that what you're thinking right now? I want to hear from the Lord. I hope that's exactly what it is. And what do you need to hear? The instruction of your dad, your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother. So I've got a couple points here. First of all, teaching the children wisdom is the responsibility of both parents. It's not the responsibility of one parent. Dads, you, I, I'm going to pick on dads uh, because we tend to be the ones who think it's the woman's job to do these things. Well, yeah, religion, if you want to raise them in some kind of religion, go ahead. Just, you know, I don't care. It's, it's, as a matter of fact, in the Jewish culture, in all those days, in the instruction, they were taught by their dads. That's who taught the children. So men, you need to step up and you need to be a godly dad and raise your children in this way. Secondly, moms and dads must be in agreement consistently together with the raising of those children and how you're going to teach them and the things that you will teach them. You have, listen, those kids are evil. <laughs> they're, they're in the corner plotting against you. Nukes and, you know, propelled grenade launchers and tanks. And, you know, I get worried. I see my kids walking out to my shed and they always seem to be carrying something, you know, like, like an engine part or something. And I know that they're, they're building a tank. So you and your wife have to plot just as well together on how to get them back, right? No, what you need to do is you need to be in agreement, not just comfortable in agreement, but you need to be in, in boot step with one another about what these children need. And if you're not, 
they are going to divide you and conquer you. That's exactly what they're going to do. I deal with it all the time with dealing with couples. I deal with it all the time. They have children, always. It's their kids are dividing them. And it's not like the kids are like, mm, well, we're going to divide mom and dad today. It's just a natural tendency, man. It's just the natural tendency of these kids that they've given us, Lord. So the mention of both mother and father, and if you look at the connotation here, it's not the responsibility of the school. God forbid you leave it up to the school. Um, it's not the responsibility of the court. It's a responsibility in the home to raise children. That's exactly where it is, and it needs to be there. If you trust the government school to raise your children, you send your kids, we heard it said before, if you send your kids to Babylon, don't be shocked when they become Babylonians, right? So if you're going to send your kids off to do that, understand they're getting them six hours a day of instruction, day in and day out, day in and day out, over and over and over and over again. And believe me, there are many, many minds who are working on the principle of dividing that child from your care. That's exactly what they're doing. You can call me a nut or anything else, but it's just the truth. So what you need to do is understand you have to, and I'm not making a judgment value on if you're sending your kids to public schools or government schools. I'm just simply saying you have a lot of work to do in that child's life, a lot of work to do in that child's life. You got to be intentional. You can't, don't, don't just allow it to become easy going. You got to be intentional in their hearts and their lives, you know, and what it is. And look, if you're sending your kid to a Christian school, you better be a good parent still, you know. If you're sending your kid, if your kids are homeschooled, um, then you better self judge yourself <laughs> pretty much because <laughs> you are. You are raising the class valedictorian and the, and your home. Who's the class valedictorian, by the way? Me? Yeah. Who's your valedictorian in your home school? <laughs> are you the principal or is Mark the principal? You're going to go see the principal. You mean dad, right? <laughs> oh, okay. Just move on. All right. Yeah, I sound like my <laughs> wife. That's just like my wife. Just move on. All right. School administrator, Mark Jarvis. <laughs> You were out just at the right time, and you actually walked back in just at the right time. <laughs> Verse 9 says, for they will be, for they will be um, a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. Now, listen, James talks about two wisdoms. In the, there's two wisdoms. There's a worldly wisdom. There's the godly wisdom. Now, if you want your children or if you yourself want to follow the edicts of the world and of the worldly wisdom, you will be bound in chains also. But your chains are going to be chains that you, you don't break. And they're going to be bondage is what they're going to be. And they're going to be hurtful. They're going to be painful. And they're going to, they're going to lead you in places you do not want to go. We studied the kings. And we know that Manasseh, they, they hooked him up and they led him where he didn't want to go. That's worldly wisdom. If you follow worldly wisdom, you are going to be a prisoner of that wisdom. And it will, unfortunately, be a chain in your life. But what they're saying here is there's a graceful ornament. And that is when you follow the, the word of God, the wisdom that comes from above. And what they're talking about, that's a chain that's called bling bling, right? That's a chain that we want to be in. That's a chain that's a beautiful chain. That's a chain of adornment. And he's saying if you have graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck, there's a big difference between what's going on. Again, the greatest ornament, the greatest gift that you should be giving is the, the ornament of grace. You should be teaching your kids about grace, about mercy, about love. You should want to desire to learn these things in your life. Look, a lot of the application made here is for parents and children and everything else, but it's application for all of us. We should all desire to live our lives in such a way where we're learning about the grace, the mercy, and the love of God. Tin says, once again, he's talking to my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. We are a free moral agent. Do you understand what that means? You make decisions. I know there's a teaching, and I know there are people say that you never do, that everything is kind of laid out. You don't have any choice in life. My son, if sinners entice you, well, if sinners are enticing you, you're making a choice. Is that true? If sinners entice you, do not consent. Don't get involved. Now, this is beautiful, practical wisdom. This is what you should be thinking to yourself right now. You should be saying, 
I don't need to be involved in that. I shouldn't be drawn to that. I'm not going into that arena. Use your own free will to say, no, I'm not going to do it. Boy, what a shocking statement, huh? In the age of, in the age of where everybody's a victim, victimology. Oh, I'm just a victim. You don't understand the way I was raised. You don't understand what happened in my life. I wet the bed. I had not, no wonder I made this decision in my life. Eh, wrong answer. You are a new creation, new creature in Christ. All the old things are passed away. Behold, everything's become new. Your wisdom is no longer the wisdom of the world. Your wisdom now is the wisdom that comes from above. And if you don't believe that, then you don't believe your daddy from above is strong enough to impart that wisdom to you. The problem is you have an obstinate hard heart. You're just like the children of Israel, and you're stiff-necked, and you still want to do what you want to do, yet you want to blame anything and everyone else for the problems in your life, when the reality of it is accept the responsibility that with God's help and God's wisdom, that ship can be turned around, but as long as you want to make decisions in your own life to go off the wrong way and do the wrong things, you're going to reap, unfortunately, a very, very bitter harvest is what you're going to do. If sinners entice you, do not consent. Don't give in to it. Don't, don't allow them to, uh, to steer you. I saw one commentator say it this way. They can do thee no harm unless thy will, um, unless, uh, unless thy will join in with them. Not even the devil, listen to this, not even the devil himself can lead a man into sin till he consents. Were it not so, how could God judge the world? That's a powerful statement. Who are you listening to? Who are you blaming? Why are you in the sin that you're in? Because you made a choice. Many, many, many times we make choices. Now, listen, you may have started right here, and unfortunately you had the stack decked against you. Maybe you're from a background, from a parenting situation, whatever, that was not, not good. But the moment you signed on with Christ, all that stuff changes, right? All that stuff no longer is what you're driving for. You now have the Holy Spirit, the agent of the Spirit of God, the essence of God that lives inside of you, and it's the agent, it's the Spirit of God that now compels you. Your wisdom is gone. This is about battling the wisdom that you have and thinking that you should be doing certain things. You've got to eradicate that thought process. You've got to start renewing your mind, as Paul would say, by what? By the washing of the water of the Word, by allowing the Word of God to speak to your heart. And if they say, verse 11 says to us, come with us. Peer pressure will always impact more those who don't exercise godly wisdom. Peer pressure will always, always, always be a snare to those people who do not want to follow godly wisdom. You are susceptible to peer pressure. And peer pressure, by the way, isn't just for fourth graders. Peer pressure goes throughout life. People pressure you into doing things. They pressure, 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 and you decide. You make a decision to decide to follow. Well, that'll happen when your decision is more about the worldly wisdom than it is about the wisdom that comes from above. Um, so the first instruction that you basically get, I like this, uh, that we're getting here is uh, speaking to the company that we keep, right? To those people you're surrounding yourself with. Because let's face it, the essence of the decision-making process, if we would stop and think about who is it that is influencing me to do something? I need to eradicate that person in my life. I, I, I can't be around this person because when I'm around this, and let me tell you, some of the worst decisions I've ever made in my life has not been with an unsaved person, but it's been with a saved person. And trust me, they're somewhere right now saying the same thing. It was with a saved person. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it, how that works out? It's because we've been operating in our flesh is what it is. He speaks to the company we keep. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Don't be fooled by those who say such things. Why? Because bad company corrupts good character. Look around and see you're being influenced by, guys. Look around and see what is it that's in your head. And trust me, if it was a nine-foot ogre going, Oh, sin, I want you to sin. I want you to fall. I want you to stumble. You would say, I'm not going to have anything to do with that big ogre. The problem is the angel of light, Satan, he whispers in your ear and someone comes along and they may be well-intentioned. You don't have to do that whole Bible thing, do you? You're going to go to that Bible study again. Come on. You know, you're going to be sitting home every Friday night if you can't keep this up by yourself. That's the way it works, right? These little subtle things that come along. 
Let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us uh, swallow them alive like Sheol and whole, like those who go down into the pit. I like what it says in the New Living Translation there. It says, let's swallow them alive like the grave. Let's swallow them whole like those who go down into the pit. The pit, Sheol, is the place of death. That's what he's trying to say. That's where it leads to, guys. If you follow the wisdom of the world, you're willing to do those things, you're going to compromise um, what you know to be right. You're going to end up in the pit is where you're going to end up. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoils. You know how it is when you used to run. As, uh, as I heard the guys say, um, I've heard Chuck use it. I've heard, I've heard Zach use it. When rip and run, is that what it was? Rip and run, ripping and running or whatever it was. That's what he's talking about here. You're going you're gonna to run with people who are going to entice you to do bad things. They make these wonderful, glorious promises. Oh, yeah, if you just do this. I remember I was, I remember I was a counselor in a uh, juvenile delinquent home. Well, actually, I was a juvenile delinquent. I just called myself a counselor. It just sounded better on my resume. But um, I, remember, I remember this one kid. <laughs> I'll never forget him. He, every day I'd walk in. He'd say, yo, Gary. He goes, I just need you to go to Philly once a week. And if you'll just go to such and such an avenue, they're going to give you something. You, just, you don't even have to look in the bag is what he used to tell me. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what is it, McDonald's? I mean, it's, um, they entice you. And, of course, it comes down to money. And it comes down to, you know, look what you can do. But I always said to him, I said, uh, I won't use his name. I said, listen, at 5 o'clock, I'm going to walk out of the door. And at 5 o'clock, you're going to still be sitting right here. I'm not exchanging this for that. It just ain't going to happen. But it's the enticement. Evil people, uh, people who are not with the Lord, people who are led by the lusts of the flesh, they will entice you. This goes to even to the basic of in relationship with somebody. Look, this is why it's it's poison to date a non-believer because their their standards are different they they don't see it as different but they're pressuring you into something they want you to do something well if you really love me sweetheart you'll right this is what you're going to do and in their world that makes all the sense why because everybody they run with they think the same thing you wouldn't buy a car without kicking the tires would you don't you just love that analogy we're talking about human beings. We're talking about something wonderful and precious that God has given to us. And now you are reducing it down to a, a Ford, you know, and kicking the tires. Ladies, if you fall for that, Lord. Lord, right? So 14 says, cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. Let us all have one purse. The enticement again and all the other things that go on with that. And this is what leads, unfortunately, to the ideas of all the things going on. But let me tell you, as parents, um, what's the example you set for your kids? See, this all comes down to temptation. You want them to be tempted by the things of the Lord is what you want them to be tempted by. So you can set it up now in your homes, whether they're going to be tempted by the wisdom of the world and the people that come along, or they're going to be tempted by the things that are of the Lord. You know what I mean? What do I mean by that? Well, if you, if you will speak to your children the things of God, and you will lead them in the way of the things of the Lord, they're not going to be tempted as much by the stuff that's out in this world. Oh, that's crazy. Kids are going to have sex, so give them condoms. They're just going to do it. Because, well, why? Because they've grown up in an environment that's been laxed and in, in enforcing what they should be doing, and it's been very, very fervent. It's been very passionate about getting them to understand what they should be doing, or at least what they think they should be doing. So as a parent, what is it you're telling them? Are you practicing the wisdom of the world, or are you practicing the wisdom from above? What is it that you lay out there before your kids? What are they seeing in the example of your life? What are you saying to them? This is important, guys, because if you don't and you practice the wrong way, then what you're going to end up with, unfortunately and sadly, is you're going to end up with a bunch of people that don't understand how to battle temptation, and they're just going to fall to it. What goes on under your roof that your kids are watching you do? Are they susceptible because of the example that you're setting? We're going to close here real quick. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. Now, you know what he's saying there. He's saying, 
don't walk with them. But what he's saying to you is don't even get the first step in with them. Now, see, this is radical. This is radical because we're always taught that we need to tolerate on some level. We're always taught, well, don't be mean and don't be, don't be nasty and, and, and don't be so extreme and fanatical. But listen, I heard Charles Stanley say it one time and I thought it was brilliant. He said, if you have a teenager that wants to go, wants to, go to a party and there's an eight-foot rattlesnake that's coiled up on your front porch, you're going to do everything you can to keep that kid from going out that front door because, you know, there's a rattlesnake, right? You're going to do everything you can. The problem is, for the sake of appearance, for the sake of acceptance, for the sake of not hearing someone whine and cry for a while, you're going you're gonna to acquiesce. You're going to say, well, what's the big deal, right? Hey, just be safe. When the reality is, we have a much greater responsibility, and this goes for all of us in the room. We have a much greater responsibility to follow the wisdom of the Lord, to, to be committed to that. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We'll just a couple more verses here. For their feet run to evil. Isn't that interesting? You ever stop and think about these people that you think so highly of? Many times that's where their feet are running. It's running to evil. They don't know any better. They don't know. See, what God calls evil and what man calls good, you should be really, really, really wary about this, right? Guys, open your eyes to the world we live in today. You have agendas that are going on all around you that are absolutely antithetical to who you are as a believer. In this world today, there are things being pushed at your child's mind. There are things being pushed into your mind that you are completely at odds with, but it's being done in such a way that it's secretive, that it's covert, that it's camouflaged, and you just kind of go, well, it's okay, when the reality of it is we have to be much wiser than that. We have to be more alert than that. You better, you know, we, we all have to wake up to it. Surely in vain, the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Listen, if a bird flies into a net that it sees, it deserves to get caught, right? It just, it's flown into a net that it sees. It's not a real bright bird. The sinner that gets caught jumping into sin. When you see the net that's in front of you, once you see the sinful practice that's in front of you, you jump into it, you know that it's wrong, you know that it's there, and you know it's going to snare you. And yet you still jump into it, right? This is what he's telling us, is what he's saying. The net is there. The consequences are before us. He's talking about consequence. If you stop and think about the consequence of the action, you're looking at the net. The question is, am I still going to jump? Am I still going to get involved with it? Am I still going to go for it? Well, if you do, you're like the bird who gets caught in the net. It's not a big trick. This is what he's telling us. It's ineffective if you try to set up a net and then the bird sees it. That's what you can't do. It's got to be camouflaged is what it is. It's a lack of wisdom. It's a lack of understanding for a person who knows that it's sinful and that it's going to be end up in bad situation um, and basically saying sinners rush to their own ruin. But they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. You know what this teaches us? Birds are smarter than people. (laughs) That's what it's teaching us. Birds are smarter than people because we see the net and we still jump right into it. Well, I hope this time God's grace will cover me. You know, I know I was practicing immorality, but I'm just hoping God gives me a a, a what up. You know what I mean? I'm hoping God just forgives me this time, even though I know I'm sinning and I know I'm doing the wrong thing and I, I know I'm taking a big risk here. But, you know, God will, me and God, we got a good thing going is what we got. So. He's going to, oh, we got to finish. All right. I keep promising we're going to finish, so we're going to finish. So let's stand. Mark's down here looking at his watch, so blame Mark. (laughs) He's going to kill me one day. If I'm ever dead, look for Mark Jarvis. Let's come on in the middle, guys. Let's come on over to the middle. And, and I know a lot of you have kids down in the children's area, so we'll, we'll get you out of here in a minute. We'll pray and get you out of here. Is the book of Proverbs just extremely practical? It's just extremely practical, and it's got so much to say to you and I in the lives that we live today. 
And as you can see, the idea of wisdom, it really is a matter of black and white. It really is a matter of right and wrong. It's really a matter of godly wisdom versus the world's wisdom. That's what it comes down to. There's no big trick here. There's no, there's like, well, what are the in original Hebrew language? Well, in the original Hebrew language, it says, make the right choices. Follow the wisdom of the Lord. That's what you and I need to be doing. Everyone in this room has a testimony of when they didn't follow the wisdom of the Lord and they followed the flesh. And every one of us wishes there was a DeLorean time machine that we could jump in and some old dude would take us back in time, right? We could go back, just take me back to this day. You know what I mean? And uh, the reality is we don't get to do that. This is why grace is a wonderful thing. Because as you've come to repentance and as you've come to the place where you've sought forgiveness of God and he has forgiven you for the past sins and the things that you've done, you're no longer under the burden and the penalty of what they are. The wrath of God is not being poured out against you. The condemnation of the Lord is not being poured out against you. You are a new creature, a new creation. He loves you. He desires to walk with you again. He's not holding anything against you. I mean, it is almost magical when God says, I, I no longer, I choose not to remember your sin. I mean, that's, that's amazing, you know? How in the world does God do that? Because I choose to remember a lot of people's sin in my life, right? <laughs> Somebody's messed with me, I'm going to remember that sin. Even though love says I keep no record of wrong, well, guess what, buddy? But that's not what God does. You know, God, I'm sorry again for, and God's going, what are you talking about? What do you mean? What are you coming to me with? I've forgiven you for that, right? So you're forgiven. There's no harshness, I hope. There's no condemnation. I hope that you understand that. This is just to get us thinking, to look at everything in this world and go, okay, what filter am I reading this? What filter am I looking at this? What, how am I seeing this? Am I looking at it through the wisdom of the Lord, which I find the wisdom of the Lord when I open up those 66 books and I commit to those 66 books in the Bible. When I start studying in those and I'm rightly dividing, and the other way I kind of get that wisdom is when I allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through me. No longer following my fleshly tendencies, but I desire to follow the things of the Lord. Look, you could be in this room right now, and you're like, this guy's an idiot. He's not talking about real life. He's obviously not on the street. He's not living with my family. He's not, you know, and you're right. All those things are true. But also it's true about the wisdom and which wisdom you're following. Listen, don't allow yourself to be tainted by the enemy and by your own flesh and start to buy into a lie that your way is right. Because think about your life. If you're following your flesh right now, I want to ask you a question. Where's that gotten you so far? Right? Mm -mm. It's time that we as believers start actually being doers of the word and following what the word of God says and listening to the Holy Spirit. So, Father, thank you. And, Lord, I thank you so much for these people that are here tonight. I pray blessings on them. And, God, just the, the strength we need by the Holy Spirit to, to actually walk out and to follow because, God, left up to our own device, Lord, we choose the flesh. We know the net is right there, and we're fluttering right to that net. And, God, it's because we're not real bright, not real smart. We choose rebellion. We choose to go against your ways. We choose to think that if I just sacrifice, then I don't really need to obey. And yet, God, that's not what you tell us in your word. And so, Lord, I pray right now for each person, for myself, God, that we would become lovers of doing the things you would have us to do. Teach us the wisdom that comes from above and not the wisdom of this world. Give us such a strong distaste for sin. God, that it would not be good in our mouths, but God, it would be putrid in our mouths. It would be disgusting to us, Lord, that we would be repulsed by it, God. Lord, bring an image into our head that is the most repulsive thing we can think of and understand that's only one-tenth of what sin is in our hearts and our lives. Help us to understand how repulsive it was to you and is to you. And God, give us a glimpse of that. And then help us to think on those things which are good. Those things which are holy and pure and right. Those ways, Father, that are of you. And Lord, what a life it is to go from the darkness into the light, Father. Why do we still choose darkness, Lord? Help us to be lovers of the light. And so, God, I thank you. I praise you. And I pray for each person here, God, that they would follow you this week. 
Their desire would be to learn of you and to walk with you and to share Jesus with someone even this week. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give someone a hug before you get out of here, huh? Amen. Amen.